Hey everyone, welcome back to Bowtech Live. It is a special Friday edition. I know normally you don't see us on Friday and you guys have a long weekend coming up. We, want, we wanted to get with you because whitetail season is rapidly approaching. I know a lot of you are finishing up your, your turkey seasons. I know here in Oregon we only have really one more week. This next week is our last week to be able to seal the deal, but I know a lot of people are starting to, starting to think whitetail season. So we wanted to put together a series for you that brings in all of our celebrity hunters. That we can really pick their brain, get a lot of their knowledge as far as what they're doing this time of season, what they're thinking about, some of the top tips that you should be considering going into the season to make you a more successful hunter. And we are going to start that off with Mr. Mike Stroff from Savage Outdoors in the One because he has some great tips. He sent those over and I love the stuff that we're going to share with you today. So make sure you get your questions in because this is a great opportunity to pick Mike's brain. I know he loves sharing his wealth of knowledge. Thanks, Mike, for joining us. I know, uh, I know you, got, you ran in from uh, the field here to join us. I appreciate it. Not, not a problem. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, that's good. So what have you been up to in this season, you know, kind of coming off a of turkey season? Uh, we, you've been doing a lot with our Excalibur line, but uh, give us a, a recap what, uh, what your years look like so far. It's been good. Uh, 2018 started off good. You know, down here in Texas, we can hunt all the way through February on right? the tags. So we've been doing that. We did that, and then turkey came right after that and had a great turkey season with our outfitting businesses uh, in Texas and South Dakota and uh, uh you know travel a little bit we did stuff in illinois and now uh we just got done with the bear hunt with the excalibur killed a big black bear right up in Saskatchewan. um that was pretty cool uh we have done some uh on our ranches here in texas we've got free range axis deer on a bunch of the hill country ranches and i even killed a big axis buck in velvet about two weeks ago with the excalibur crossbow too so we've been having some fun well, that's great. It's great to hear. I mean, you keep it busy all. I know we were uh, kind of uh, trying to catch up a little bit. You had uh, reached out to me and said, hey, man, we've got some Botex stuff. You know, what, what, what can we do this time of year? So this is a good opportunity. You know, I've been thinking about this for the last couple of weeks is what can we share? You know, I've been thinking about whitetail season. And, you know, I'm like, we've talked with our Whitetail 101 as far as the biology and you know, and I know that goes a long way with a lot of the hunters, but, you know, I know they're thinking hanging tree stands and, and everything like that. So, and you fired over those tips. So let's get right into it. Again, those of you that are watching, make sure you get your questions in because we're monitoring Facebook. Those of you that are watching on Savage Outdoors on the one page, we're watching that as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll be taking questions uh, coming in from both. So it looks like we're already starting to get some stuff in, but let's go ahead and hit on these topics. So, uh, Mike, let's look at number one, the number one tip that you sent over, and it's called basically hanging tree stands. So walk us through what, as a whitetail hunter, what we should be thinking about when we're looking at hanging tree stands. Yeah, so, you know, this time of year is really when I like to hang my tree stands, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I can mm -hmm. from kind of the April to July period. And the reason, there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the biggest ones is I just don't want to be in the woods when we get close to the hunting season. Right. I want to leave the deer alone. I want them to have their, their area. I don't, they're, those bachelor groups, I sure don't want to go in there jumping on three or four times a week hanging tree stands. That's not what I want to do. So, you know, a lot of guys aren't thinking whitetails yet, uh, but in my opinion, you should be, especially if you're hunting on land that you have control of and you can access year-round. Mm -hmm. uh, why wouldn't you be doing it right now? And so I try to put that, when I do seminars and stuff, I try to put that in people's minds. Right now is when you want to think about it. So where are you hanging them for the different phases of the season? Your, pre, you know, your early season stuff, your pre-rut hunting, your right in the slam middle of the rut, your post-rut, and then your late season stuff. You know, think about where those stands need to be hung and let's get them out there. Why not do it now? You can do a lot of your trimming and then uh, and shooting lane clearing, all that stuff now. And then when it gets time for the season, you know, you go out and you check your straps, make sure everything's safe, make sure your lifelines are on, you're ready to hunt, you're not in there disturbing everything and changing the area that those deer are comfortable being in. Mm hmm that's a great point. It's a great point because I see it a lot, especially, you know, with people even prepping bows, but getting into the, getting out into the field, they're waiting till July at the, I would really at the earliest, but you know, we get a lot of season people start thinking like for us out here, we don't have whitetail by any means, but end of August, beginning of September is when our deer season. So they're getting their bows worked on. They're not even thinking about getting in the field yet. So they're hitting the field mid August and doing exactly what you're telling them not to do is when the deer are moving they're in the field and well a lot of guys do for whitetails right now especially in the midwest they're planting food plots right now right and so right. 
thinking about how you plant your food plot to plant it so that the bright tree works. You know, think about where your stand locations need to be. Think about what you, how you want to hang your stands while you're doing that. Because a lot of guys are like, yeah, I'm working on food plots right now, not tree stands. Well, they coexist and it's uh, something very important you need to think about. So, right. um, you know, where those stands need to be hung is critical. So this is the time of year to really be planning that out. Right, right. And I think you're, and that brings us into good, you know, the point number two is hang your stands early. Um, you know, if you're able, to, as I think you said, if you're able, able to not do that, you're not in the woods close to your hunting season. So I think that's kind of what you, what you talked about really with, you know, ultimately yeah. hanging. Yeah. And, and on the hanging tree stands, another thing to think about is these different stages of the season. So the early season stuff, obviously the bucks are still bats are grouped up, food and water are kind of what dictates life, that and safety, mm-hmm. um, you mm-hmm. know, where they're bedding and how they get to and from that food and water. Uh, those stands are probably not as productive in the late season hunt or, or even during the rut, depending on what, what's going on and how your deer move around. So, you know, I've got stands that are definitely good oct- September, October stands. And then when we get into that pre-rut period and the bucks are cruising, I'm thinking more about pinch points and not necessarily focusing on food as much. Uh, it's more about when they're cruising the timber, having stands hung in those proper pinch points where I can get in and out and hunt those deer when they're on their feet, really trying to find those first hot does. Mm-hmm. You know, those type of stand locations are extremely different. So it's really important to think about that when you're thinking about your stand locations. Look at your topo maps. Find those critical pitch points that really narrow the deer down. So when the bucks are on their feet cruising looking for does, you can be in those areas. You know, our place in Illinois, that is a critical factor. Food is important, sure, but, you know, when we get into that pre-rut, I'm all about getting in timber I know bucks live in and where's the pinch point. And if I spend enough hours in the pinch point, I'm going to get an opportunity. Um, so when you're thinking about hanging those stands, that's you know something to really you know consider. Um, and then those post rut area you know stand locations, and then even late season food lo- you know stand setups, um, you know is something you should be thinking about right now because you're planting food plots right now. Um, you know how am I going to set up? How am I going to get in and out of those areas? And uh, mm-hmm. what's going to get me an effective shooting range on those food plots? Right, and that, that really leads us into your your tip number three is make sure you have a plan. To, to exit and or enter and exit your stand locations. Yeah, one of the biggest mistakes I think whitetail hunters make is everybody is so caught up in hunting the wind, making sure the wind is perfect, uh, making sure your stand is hung with the perfect wind. But if you can't get in and out of that stand without the deer knowing you're there, you're going to be clearing timber blocks and running deer around that you don't even know you're running around. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you'll sit there and go, gosh, on my camera, they're here every day. Why, when I'm sitting here, are they not here? It's because they know you walked into that block with timber. Or they know that you walked into that food plot. So you're, the way you get in and out of your tree stand is where the wind is right for that walk in and out, where they can't see you and they can't hear you. Uh, so basically you're coming in and out invisible or trying to the best you can. That is as, as critical as the stand location as anything else. And I harp on that in the seminars I do for whitetail hunters. And it's something that's very overlooked. You can hang the perfect stand set up and it not work. And that's because you can't get in and out of it right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I mean, is it, I mean, you're clearing brush and things like that, correct? I think I think that you're kind of because that's one thing I did. I'm from Ohio, so I never really got serious about that until I was pretty much ready to move out here to Oregon. But it really helped me, you know, just clearing brush, clearing high grass, things of that nature. Yes, yes, that's part of it. But also, I mean, you got to think about your your product, the wind you're going to hunt a stand sure, on. So sure. if it's a northwest wind setup, and you can't with the northwest wind get into that stand without the wind blowing into the bedding areas where the deer are coming from, they still know you're there, or they know some someone's been there, or you know things are safe. And those big mature bucks, they're not going to make that mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, so the wind direction on how to walk in and out, and really line of sight to that bedding area, because typically they'll bed in ways they can see more than you can see, and if they see you going in there. That can be a problem as well. So right. yeah, you want to cut your trails. You know, make sure you got an easy way in and out. But really, for me, it's about the wind direction that I'm going to hunt that stand on, mm-hmm. and I get in and out of there without telling every deer in the block of timber I'm there. Mm-hmm. Those of you watching, make sure you get your questions in. I see a lot of great comments coming in, uh, saying hello, Mike. You know, from we got a hey from Georgia, from Ray Buckner. Um, looks like we have some international folks saying hello as well, so it's great they're joining us. Chef Dakota Collins and Jonathan Collins are joining us here, so uh, they're uh, they're probably uh, watching with you. I know at some point we need to connect these guys with you, kind of get out there and do some cool stuff, you know, do some hunting and do some um, some food segments. I actually talked to Chef Collins, Jonathan this morning about you know connecting with you guys and, and doing some cool 
co-content where they can you guys can team up and also do some cooking in the field. I, I like to eat venison, so yeah. backstrap. Uh, on the menu <laughs> yeah he can, he can i know you've uh, you've hunted and cooked quite a bit but jonathan can give you uh, some great ideas some stuff you have not done before i've learned a ton from him as well so you talked about having you know make sure you have a plan to enter and exit and you're talking about pushing bucks out so that really gives us a good opportunity to talk about number four and i think a lot of hunters don't do this they just go in hoping to see bucks so basically number four is take a buck inventory yeah, and here's a big thing. You know, guys will ask me all the time, you know, so how do you always kill or consistently kill big mature whitetails? Well, first off, you have to hunt where they live or you mm -hmm. have no chance to kill them. And so right. I know that sounds simple, but if, if you're hunting an area that they're just not in, it's, it's impossible or you're going to have to get really lucky and have one just get lost and run through that area. So I like to, you know, from, you know, mid July on basically have my cameras out and I'm, and I'm having, I have the cameras on locations that are more about taking inventory. So I'm trying to get an idea of how many bucks I've got on a certain property, what bucks are there, get an idea of their age class, and then kind of put a little hit list together. Like here's my four or five bucks. I want to try to, you know, either any of these deer would work, you know, based on their age and their size and all that stuff. Um, you know, it's also when you can identify management bucks or cold bucks that need to go, you know, mm -hmm, if you're really mm -hmm manage a property um you know and and that buck inventory though it's just it's critical because you know if you're sitting there and it's like man i'm just not holding the bucks you know and and that can be an issue that can be resolved you know by different types of food sources or you're in the wrong area you need to move you know that it's a, it's a smart thing to do and it also just gives you an idea of what you're looking for when the fall does roll around mm -hmm. and i think that's a lot of people don't even think about you know is is taking that buck inventory you know they're they're just like I was saying, they're, they're hoping to see bucks. And I mean, it just, it's a plan that comes, to, you know, that really helps it come together because you know ahead of the game what bucks you want to hunt. I think that's exactly what you're saying because, you know, you're well, not yeah. playing. There, there's also the, the scenario where in, say, July, August, September, and I'm at the bachelor groups are maybe hitting a particular food plot. You've got a couple of really good bucks coming and going. You can get on those deer depending on when your season starts in that early season period. And that buck inventory or that running those cameras is the key to knowing right. exactly what they're doing and what time and when they're doing it. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of your seasons come in in September, early October, and you can slam some of those big bucks. When you see one buck, you see six or seven bucks because they're still together. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can really pattern them and you're doing that off this buck inventory effort you made in the summer. All right. Well, here's a good comment, uh, not, not necessarily a question, but from Ray Bru uh, uh, Buckner. Sorry, sorry, Ray. Um, he's out of, uh, out of Georgia. So he's already started hanging his stands, and he's also glassing on a daily basis and running cams also. So I'm glad he mentioned glassing because that's your, your tip number five is get out in there and glass. Well, and, and the reason that I, I bring up glassing and in, in, uh, preseason scouting stuff is because you can't get every deer on camera on your trail cameras. It, it just doesn't work. You know, they'll walk behind it, they walk around it, or they're walking a different trail. And sometimes good old fashioned, just get out and scout is the best way to put your eyes on them and figure out what they're doing. You know, mm -hmm. if you're watching mm -hmm. Beanfield in Ohio, like where you're from or something, you know, they right. can sit there and watch how they come and go out of the field. And even if you're not seeing the big bucks, you see how the deer act in the field. You see how they, you know, when they come out into a food plot or field, they, they kind of tend to feed a certain direction or out into a certain part of the field. And that can help you hang your stands too. Maybe the corner they come in, the wind's wrong, but by the time they feed for 20 or 30 minutes and they get out in the field, they end mm -hmm. up in a place that will work. Uh, and without glassing, you would never know that. Right. Uh, sitting in the wrong place. What time, of, what time of day, what time of, you know, you may have multiple times, what, what should they be looking at to get out there in glass? Morning, midday, afternoon? This time of year, you know, uh, especially through the summer months when it's super hot, that first couple of hours of daylight and the last couple of hours of daylight, you know, of course, you're going to see a lot more activity because it's just crazy hot, you know, that middle of the day right. level. There's these, especially those big bucks, you know, they got a lot of fat on them and they're, they're hot and they're just like us. They get lazy and their bellies are full and there's no pressure on them. And so they don't move a lot, but mm -hmm. you know, you can obviously glass anytime you want, but sure. you know, typically uh, the first couple hours of daylight and last couple hours is when mm -hmm. I'll be I'm out there putting the, putting eyes on them. Right, right. Well, Mike, those are great tips. I know we uh, we have a lot of people. I know it's early in the day yet, so we don't have a we have quite a few people watching. I know a lot of people are, are uh, probably just not quite home from work yet, but uh, we're, we have a lot of good comments. People just saying hello, coming in, and everything else. Um, let's talk about your your shows going right now. So, what can we uh, look forward to coming up on uh, Savage Outdoors and the One? 
Yeah, so Savage Outdoors, you know, it, it airs year round. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's airing five times a week on Sportsman Channel. So it's easy to catch Savage Outdoors. Our prime airs in that uh, real tree uh, hunt camp block on Tuesday nights. Uh, we've got a great season. We really put together, I think, the best overall season for Savage Outdoors that we've done in all the years we've been doing that show. This is a really good fall. The you know, third and fourth quarter is just stacked up with big whitetails, elk, mule deer, um, caribou. It's uh, big bears. It, it's been. It was a really good year last year for filming for us, and we put together some great shows. And third quarter is about to kick off. So first of July, you know that July Fourth week. That's when all the new shows start airing, and uh, you know we kind of save our best uh, big game content for that period of time. So we're excited about it because it's like, man, all that hard work finally gets to pay off. Right. And people finally get to watch it a little bit. Um, you know, and then with the one, uh, it's a different kind of show. You know, it's something we did different for the Outdoor Channel. Uh, and we're excited about it because it really shows our team off and all the guys and all the behind the scenes things that we do to, to get that one opportunity or go to that one location. And, uh, it shows off the personalities a little bit. It's got a little bit of a reality is not the right word, but personality based program. And uncle Randy gets to show his true colors a little right. bit, uh, <laughs> uh, Jamie, you know, everybody that's involved in what we do. Uh, and so it's a cool show and get guys get to see what we're really going through. And, uh, some of our, uh, what used to be behind the scenes fights of Savage Outdoors are now on the air. On yes. the one. Yep. It all comes. You know, I've had an opportunity, I know as well as Jeff Suter, our director of marketing to, to really work with you guys outside of the television. I got to spend a week with you guys down there hunting and I know Jeff's done it a few times and I know a lot of people ask and, and, you know, especially with Randy, you know, it, it, is that is that Randy? Because I know, and I think some of the some of the shows he's a little mellowed out for Randy. But you know, are, uh, I know a lot of people ask, are are you guys putting on a front? Is is that how you guys really are, especially Randy? Well, on, on Savage Outdoors, uh, yeah, that's probably a mellow Randy. But on the one, we turn him loose and let him be himself, and so that is about as Randy as you can get. Uh, yeah, Timothy Sam at his finest. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know there's, you know, when I was hunting, I had an opportunity to, uh, there was a, a doe that came in and uh, he, he gave me, well, I, the, the, the guide was kind of on, uh, was kind of like, I don't know if she's an old, you know, old enough to shoot. So we ended up not shooting it. And Randy just absolutely throttled me when I, when he came in to pick us up that night because I didn't shoot that. I'm like, I'm pointing at, at him and I'm like, hey, he told me not to shoot it. But and, well, uh, and I, if you got throttled, I can yeah. assure you that guide had a terrible night because yeah. Randy got the side said hey you're doe hunting what does it matter what size that doe is big small they're all taste the same in fact the smaller ones taste better i can hear the lecture he was giving them <laughs> yeah <laughs> our av guys over there laughing because i've told him that story i think we were just talking about it before we went on the air i said you know right I, I bring it up all the time that you know he's you know he sees them you know he's not super aware of them he we have a big the big poster of you guys in the front office with all of our our celebs and it has randy on there and i was telling him about it i said yeah randy's you know this is the way this guy is you know he's oh, yeah. you know he wears furs every day and his cowboy hat every day it's like his uniform when he wakes up you go in his closet there and open the doors it's like there's a the those shirts and you know his blue jeans and his boots and his hats yep. and all that like there's uniforms of Randy standing there starched ready to go for the next day. Well, that, that, you know, that my favorite episode and I keep it on our DVR is the one where you guys were hunting and he had the horse and the badge and he was dead set. He was going to use that horse. Um, you walked in, but he was, you know, I love it because that's, you know, to me, that's Randy. He's got to have the badge, He's, you know, the old West. And You were asking about episodes that are coming up. So this fall on the one, there's another show in South Dakota at our lodge there, Western Ranch Outfitters, where we're doing an antelope hunt. And Randy is guiding me, or he's running the horses, so to speak, on the spot and stock hunt with the bow. And Randy definitely pulls out all the stops. And uh, I won't ruin the episode, but there's some funny stuff there. And Randy definitely gets to play cowboy, and he messes with me on it and uh takes a horse out that really didn't work well for me so it, it it's a funny episode when guys get to see that one it's labeled uh, the name of the show is two feathers okay uh, definitely want to watch that one. Oh, two feathers everybody watch out for that one that one's gonna be, it sounds like it's gonna be a good one all right so everybody knows you're a whitetail hunter and you do the elk and everything. what's your favorite species i know you'll probably say whitetail so let's say outside of whitetail what is your favorite species and why to hunt outside of that i uh I caught the sheep hunting bug a number of years ago, and it's mm-hmm. gonna, it's really hard for to to explain 
what it's like to be on those sheep hunts. And when you're actually able to get one, you know, it's just an amazing sense of accomplishment. Uh, I really enjoy that. I've, I've been able to do a couple of different sheep hunts. I've, and, uh, I still haven't killed a Rocky mountain bighorn, which is the one I need to complete my slam. And I really want to do that. Right. Um, probably my favorite. Uh, and then of course it's hard to beat a screaming elk though. Uh, when you're bow hunting and get right in their face, that, that's a tough one to beat too. But the overall experience, the overall hunt, I would say sheep hunting for me. Probably. What about uh, anything like African game or anything like that? You know, to be honest with you, Africa is not really my thing. Um, mm -hmm. I've been one time, uh, we did Plains game. We did a Cape Buffalo. We did, you know, I got to experience a lot of different things and I enjoyed it. I had a great time and mm -hmm. I'd probably go back. Uh, but if I personally wanted to take the time and spend my money and time to go do a big hunt for myself, it would be, I got to get in the mountains in North America. It's just sure. something about I just, I got to, I love sure. being in the And the reason I ask that is, uh, our, our biggest dealer, our, our distributor there in South Africa, um, Reg Grant just popped in. Um, oh. and I think that, I think he's the guy that you want to get out there. I think he would, uh, you would uh, make your experience over the top, I think, just in the camaraderie itself. He's a great guy, so I had to give a shout out to Reg Grant when he popped in. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd love, like I say, I'd go back. It's just I've always been so caught up in North American big game stuff. And yeah. You know what? To be honest with you, I haven't shot enough elk. <laughs> That's true. Go. That's so, true. Yeah. You know, I, I, I shot a, a spike. I w went out to a place uh, that Chris Kamen, uh, NBA retired star. Um, has out here in in Oregon. I shot a spike last year, but you know, even that, it was a phenomenal experience. You know, thirty yards, you know, spike. I, I don't think you can beat it. I mean, I've shot some white tail out where I lived and some black tail here, but you know, shooting something that size that close, it's it's definitely experience. Oh yeah, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I know you ran in here to join us from the field, and I know you have a lot of work to do yet today out in the field, and I appreciate you joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. And, you know, everybody get out there and hang your tree stands and think about it now. Plan. you got a couple months to do the planning and get yep. it done right. It'll, it'll make a big difference this fall, I promise. Absolutely. And everybody watching, what we're going to do is we're going to do a recap with all these tips. I'm going to put together, uh, you know, a top 15, a top 20 list from all these guys. And that way you can get in, get a recap of what they're doing and what they're recommending you guys to do right now. So, Mike, where can everybody check you out and when on Savage Outdoors and also the one? Yeah, so, uh, you know, of course, go to our website, savageoutdoors.tv. That website houses uh, information for both shows. Yep, yep. Um, follow us on Facebook. Uh, and then, uh, you know, Savage Outdoors Primair Tuesday nights uh, on the Realtree Hunt Camp block, 10 o'clock Eastern, so easy to catch us. Uh, and then on the one, we start airing third quarter, so that first week of July, it'll come back on the Outdoor Channel on Sunday mornings. So we'd love for you guys to watch us. We appreciate yeah. all the support. Perfect time to, to really get in front of those, uh, get you all excited about hunting season coming up, you know, here in July. I know we hear it all the time. That's when our phones start ringing off the hook here, wanting to get new bows and where to get them. And, you know, July's a great, July 4th is when it hits for us. So. Yep, it's coming I quick. Love, I love it. Those of you that are tuning in, I appreciate you joining us. Make sure you text "Go Live" to 77453 and you'll get a notification just like those viewers that have already texted that did today. Actually, I have my phone in the drawer right here. I got a text right away when we were live with Mike. So make sure you text that "Go Live" to 77453. That'll give you access to all of our Bowtech Live content from Chef uh, Jonathan Collins, like we talked about earlier. Jeremy Starks, who's also tuning in, he does Whitetail 101. He's our wildlife biologist along with David Miller. Great wealth of knowledge there because you can learn a ton about habits, feeding, things of that nature, watering. So we have a lot of cool stuff coming up with those guys as well. Uh, we have Nate Zielinski. We have Randy Newberg. So if you're into elk, Randy Newberg is a wealth of knowledge as well. He was actually just on the other night and had some great tips. So make sure you tune in all week long. We'll be over the weekend. We'll have some stuff starting again on Monday of next week. So again, make sure you text go live to 77453. So again, Mike, I appreciate you joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. It was a blast. Uh, not a problem. Make sure you guys check him out on the Savage Outdoors and also the one. Until next time, have fun and shoot straight.